morning. It is great to welcome you on this 4th of July weekend, uh, whether you are worshiping with us right here in the sanctuary or you're worshiping with us at home uh, or maybe even on vacation somewhere. That's the nice thing about that. No matter where you are, we can worship together. We are the body of Christ, and we're glad that you're here. I hope your 4th of July weekend is, is going well and, and uh, you know, you're having a great time. Uh, I'm so excited about this worship service. Uh, just praying about it last night, looking at all that's going to happen, I think that it is uh, an opportunity to really connect with God. So my encouragement to you today as we gather together is that whatever it is you're carrying inside of you, whatever burden might be there, whatever struggles you might be having, whatever decisions you might be facing, whatever problems that you're dealing with, that you're able to lift them up to the Lord and, and allow him to, to have them during this time, and that you simply open yourself to him. He'll have something to say to you today as you worship and honor him for who he is. So we are very glad that you're here. There's, there's little uh, cards in the, in the back of the pew. We want to encourage you, if you would, to fill those out. And on your way out today, you can put them in the offering plate. There's two up here, and there's one in the back. Um, so, so please uh, be sure to do that. And obviously, those offering plates are there as you're going out for, for offerings as well. Uh, I do want to remind you, our board meetings are tomorrow night, and they are in-person board meetings. And there was an email sent out that would tell you what room you're meeting in so we can socially distance and do that as well. Uh, also, the uh, advisory council is going to meet here in the sanctuary. Plenty of room spread out. So, so that's going to happen tomorrow evening. Just, just be aware of all of that. Uh, we're, we're, we're excited about just being together when we have the privilege and opportunity to do that. So I trust that you are ready to lift up the name of the Lord. Let's worship him and let's honor him today. Oh, I guess I'm up. <laughs> what a good morning to see everybody. Uh, you know, I got to thinking, we've had a rough year, amen? And uh, the thing of it is, at the begin before the beginning of the year, we were so excited that all of our boards were staffed pretty much to capacity. The deacon board for the first time, and I'm pretty old, I remember way back, for the first time I can remember was staffed at 18 really good deacons. And we thought, how great. But then God did that for a purpose. I truly believe that. And it's going to be scary when God staffs our boards all full. Again, we're going to think, wonder what's up. Uh, God knew what was going to happen this year. Joel preached last week, and I missed it, Joel, um, the, what we've been through. You know, I, I'm not whining, but I, it's been pretty rough. And it's been spiritual warfare from the first month of the year. Uh, we've had the COVID virus thing. Y'all heard of that. And, and I, I think y'all look so cute in your little masks. You look really good. Uh, and, and now we've got a lot of unrest in our country. People unhappy, people mad. And we've got a, uh, of all things, we've got an election campaign coming up where people are going to be divided. So it causes division and, and breaking our hearts, it causes division in our church. Now James says that these hard times build character. We, we, we persevere through these hard times and we become stronger and, and we find out how to fight off sin. But most important, Paul writes in Hebrews 12. Let me tell you what Paul says, and this is kind of like, this is kind of like a rah rah cheer cheer go get them team. And this is for you, church. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Here's the key. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring the, its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition 
from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Church, let's not grow weary. Let's be happy. Let's thank God this morning for everything he's done. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do open up this church service. God, just praising you this morning. And God, our praises for you is for everything you've done, Father. And sometimes we get leery and lose heart. And we put our heads down and say, gosh, it's too hard. But Lord, we remember what you did on the cross. We remember how they rejected you. We remember how you gave up your life for us to fight sin. And Lord, we can endure through this. We can run this race. We can, we can finish this battle, God. It's not too much for us if we have you. And God, we open this service in praise for you. And God, we just asked you this morning to be with us in this service, and we know you will. And God, we, we just lift our songs that Tom will lead, the praise team. And God, we lift up communion that we may never forget what you've done for us. And God, we lift this full service, everything that Joel says in his message, that we take to heart and we listen. And God, we just invite you to be with us today and make this service great. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I feel so blessed to be here this morning to, to gather as we worship, as we learn. It's just great to be with you. Uh, we, we're going to lift up the, the Lord's name this morning. We're going to worship him. We're going to praise him with our hearts. And let's start that by standing and we're going to sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. morning. I don't think there are any children in the sanctuary today. None? Zero? So you guys get to just 
hear me, and I get to talk to the children at home. First of all, I want to thank everybody for giving me this opportunity to, or entrusting me to go each week and, and make something to say to the children. Um, it's really helped me quite a bit because I get to study really, really hard, and there's no lesson plan, no book that I'm going through. I'm kind of just going through the Bible. So I want to thank Pastor Joel for taking us back through the Minor Prophets because it has been very eye-opening for me. It's really, really helped me to learn quite a bit, um, more than I had originally, well, a lot more than I thought I knew. So it's um, really been a great, great opportunity. So thank you for that. I just wanted to take that moment to say that. So today we're talking about Obadiah. And I love to say that name, Obadiah. And when we do this with the kids, which we very rarely um, upstairs do we get to talk about the minor prophets, but um, when we do, all the kids like to say Obadiah, Obadiah, Obadiah. So it's, it's kind of fun to do. And if you read the Facebook post from Pastor Joel yesterday, he kind of took my um, trivia question there about it being the shortest <laughs> from the Old Testament. Um, so what we know about Obadiah is that his name means the Lord's servant. And I think that's really neat to go through these um, names to see what they actually mean. And when you look them up, it's really cool to find out what some of these names mean. So we are going to talk a little bit about pride. And when we talk about pride, think about things that you might be proud of. Um, maybe for you kids at home, maybe you are the best. So you think you're the best soccer player. Or maybe you're the smartest in your class. Maybe you do things so much better than everybody else. But if you have to stop and think about it, what does God think about pride? Does God like when we're, when we're super proud of ourselves and we think we're better than anybody? When we think that we are above others and we think so much of ourselves that we're just going to have a snotty attitude about it? It's kind of not how we should be, right? God doesn't like that. God doesn't like us to be super proud or prideful or anything like that because everything that we're given and all of those talents that we have come from God, and we need to give him the glory of everything that we're given and all of our talents. So we are going to go back just a little bit because there where we're going to go is from Jacob and Esau. And so when we remember Jacob and Esau, we remember they were brothers and they did not get along there for a while, um, that Esau was so hungry and so just thinking about himself that he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. And so everything that comes from these towns that we're talking about is coming from Jacob and Esau. So Jacob had faults, as we all do. He tricked his poor old father, and he got the blessing from his father Isaac before he died. And Esau was very upset. And now that the people that we're talking about, they're, they're the families of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob's family in his town, they were believers of God, and they were... Um, followers of God's promises, and then the town of Edom, which is from Esau, was not so much that. They put all of their trust in themselves, and they didn't rely on God for anything. So we have brothers, we have sisters, some of us, and we love our brothers and sisters, right? So we also have our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's our church family. And we should always want to take care of our brothers and sisters. Always want to be thinking of them and taking care of them. But imagine if that wasn't the case. So the people from Jacob, the Israelites, they were not cared for by the Edomites. So in fact, when Israel was attacked, the Edomites stood by and thought it was funny. They didn't care, they didn't try to help. And to beat all, went in and stole all their stuff. So that is just ten times worse. 
So what do you think God thought about that? He was not happy. He was already upset that the Edomites were filled with pride, that they thought no one could ever take them down. And they sat and watched the Israelites be destroyed. And God then said that all of the things they had done would be done to them. You know why? Because God loves and protects his people. And we should always seek to live for God and always want his promises. And we should always look out for our brother and sister. If we see someone hurt, what should we do? We should want to try to help them because that's what we do. If we see someone sad, what should we do? We should really try to help them, try to lift them up, whether it be in prayer, whether it be just our presence with them. We should always want to take care of one another. We should always let the light of Christ shine through us and be good to one another because that's what God wants. Always be good to one another. And as Jim told us, we talked about a little bit earlier about how we're being divided really pray about that kids pray about I know that there's not a whole lot that you guys maybe not are understanding right now but just just be in prayer that we all come together and everybody sees the light of Christ and make sure that you are letting your light shine wherever you go wherever you can let your light shine prayer let's continue to pray together this morning Lord, we are so grateful for who you are. And we are so thankful that we can be here to worship and honor you first and foremost. For you are an awesome God. You are holy and all-powerful and all-knowing. And despite our sin and our rebellion against you, you've chosen to, to sacrifice your Son to bring us into relationship with you and to make us your very own. Lord, on this 4th of July weekend, we want to say thank you for allowing us to be citizens of this country. Lord, we're grateful for a country that, that offers so many freedoms. Freedoms that, that as people in other countries and places look at, look at us, they, they can only long for, they can only imagine the freedoms that we have. Yet in many ways today, our country is hurting. Lord, we, we live in a country that is sought to do justly and, and to walk with you, but, but yet we are, we are being impacted by a virus that has brought sickness and, and death to many. Lord, recent events have, have uncovered divisions among us, uh, racially and, and politically, that are, that are deeper than maybe we thought or realized. So, Father, we pray that you would bring healing for those who are struggling with illness. We pray that you would bring peace and civility in our conversations about politics and race. And Lord, as your people, as your church, help us to show the way. Help us to live as good citizens of heaven and good citizens of St. Albans or the other communities that we may come from. May our lives point to You, Lord, in, in positive ways so that our love for You and our love for each other and our love for the people around us is contagious. And Lord, and in that way, help us to be agents of change in our country, in our world, and in our communities. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light it overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the water, 
speaks to the sea who stands in the fire beside me he roars like a lion he bled as a lamb he carries my healing in his hands Jesus there is a name I call in times of trouble there is a song that comforts in the night there is a voice that calms the storm that rages he is jesus jesus who walks on the waters who speaks to the sea who stands in the fire beside me he roars like a lion he bled as the lamb he carries my healing in his hands jesus messiah my savior there is power in your name you're my rock and my redeemer there is power in your name in your name you walk on the waters you speak to the sea you stand in the fire beside me god you roar like a lion you bled as the lamb you carry my healing in your Amen. We have the privilege of sharing together this morning in the Lord's Supper. And the reason we do that is there is no one like Jesus. There's no one that's done what he's done on our behalf. He's the one and only. You know, we're not the only ones doing this this morning because at home, uh, Many of our folks, and hopefully all of them, are, are going to be taking communion with us. And it's a very special, special time. You don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church. You hear me say that every time. The only thing we ask is that you're a follower of Jesus. And that your heart is pursuing him and, and belongs to him. I want to read a passage of scripture from Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 14 since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. In verse 17, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a, a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he's able to help those who are being tempted would you pray with me father as we approach this these moments of being able to take the bread symbolic lord of your broken body for us may we truly take a moment and and reflect upon the love of your son that was willing to give himself for us, to open a door for us to you. 
God, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us. Prepare our hearts in this moment to take the bread. Amen. On the night of the Passover, Jesus gathered with his apostles in the upper room in Jerusalem. And before they shared the meal, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks for it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Psalm 133, 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And, and unity is one of those things that, that in our country seems to have been elusive in recent months. But we pr know that when we come together and we share the Lord's Supper, that it is His broken body and it, it is His shed blood that makes us one in Him. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26 says, In the same way, after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of Me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. As we share this cup together, let's remember this, this unity that it brings us. And let's look forward expectantly to that time when we get to see Him come for us. Let's share the cup together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of taking the bread and the cup. Thank you for the moments of, of reflection and remembrance of the great, great, incredible love that you have for us. And God, may you sense our deep love for you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. 
This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I You turn in your Bibles there. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a little challenging to find it because it's only twenty one verses out of sixty six books. So you're gonna have to look hard. Of course, since we're going in order through the minor prophets, you probably would look right after the book of Amos and you'll find it. This is our fourth minor prophet. And so far, I think, I think if you think about the minor prophets, there's a theme that jumps to your mind. When you think about the prophet Hosea, you think about infidelity in the marriage relationship uh, between Gomer and, and Hosea as symbolic of that 
uh, infidelity of Israel in their covenant relationship with God. When you think about the prophet Joel, you think about locusts and the day of the Lord. When you think about the prophet Amos, you think about the call for justice. And today, when you think about the prophet Obadiah, I never really thought about that, Kelly. Obadiah, Obadiah. That's, uh, Edom's pride. Pride is, is, is what this, the, the message of this book is, is all about and, and the, the, the danger it causes us. You know, not much is known about Obadiah. There are 13 Obadiahs mentioned in the scriptures. And uh, as, as Kelly reminded us, it means servant of the Lord. It also can be translated worshiper of the Lord. And scholars aren't all agreed on exactly when the book of Obadiah was written. But it makes a whole lot of sense to believe it was written between 586 B.C. and 553 B.C. Why does that make sense? Well, because, as Kelly shared, they stood by and watched as Jerusalem was destroyed and attacked. And, and that, of course, 586 B.C., one of the major dates of Old Testament history we want to keep in mind is when the Babylonian army came down and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed Judah. 553 B.C. is when the Babylonian army came along and destroyed Edom as a nation. So somewhere between the two, probably closer to 586, uh, is, is when the prophet Obadiah spoke these words. We're going to read an entire book of the Bible today, right now, all right? So I hope you have Obadiah there. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise and let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau, synonymous with Edom, how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, old team, and will be terrified. And everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, synonymous with Judah, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor look down on them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives or hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. And as you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy. 
And the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. The house of Jacob will be a fire. The house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be the stubble. They will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau. People from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria. And Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan, they will possess the land as far as Zarephath, which is up in the Sidon area. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Zephyrod will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. May our hearts, may our minds, may our spirits be receptive and open to whatever it might be that God has to say to us this morning. As Kelly shared a little bit with you in, in the children's story, there's quite a history between Judah uh, and, and Edom. And it goes all the way back about 1,500 years from the day of Obadiah. goes all the way back to the book of Genesis and the birth of Jacob and Esau to Isaac and Rebekah. And if you want to read about that and really go after it on your own a lot more than we can do this morning, uh, there's some chapters listed up there in Genesis 27, 32, 33, 36. Those are some real important chapters in Genesis. I would encourage you, if you haven't done it already, to go back and, and read those. And, and as you heard, Esau uh, sold his birthright for a, for, a, for a bowl of stew. Jacob connivingly stole his father's dying blessing. And of course, the two brothers hated each other. Esau was so furious with Jacob, Jacob fled for his life at the, at the admonishment and encouragement of his mother. And they ended up at least 20 to 25 years, maybe even a little more than that, apart from each other. You know, a lot of things happen in 20 plus years between brothers. And uh, they both were married. They both raised families. They both got quite wealthy as, as they went along. In Genesis 33, you read about the, re, the reunion of the two where Jacob is coming home. Jacob is shaken in his boots. He's scared to death. And in chap, chapter 33, it says, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. Of course, Jacob's thinking this means death to him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maidservants. <clears throat> he put the maidservants and their children in the front. Leah and her children next, Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and, and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. He wanted to show Esau complete submission and humility. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. What a beautiful picture of reconciliation of forgiveness, of coming together. Both of the, both of the brothers, Jacob and Esau, were, were, were so wealthy and had so many flocks, there really wasn't room for them both in the same spot. That's why Esau decided to go southeast. And there's a, there's a, a map that's going to show you just where Edom is. Uh, as you look at, at that map, it's... it's that area south and southeast of, of the Dead Sea it was called Sierre at that time. But as you know, bad blood arose between the two. 400 years later, and you keep your eye on that map right there, 400 years later, Moses is leading, and we read this in Numbers 20, Moses has, has been used by God to set the people free from their captivity in Egypt, and he's leading them up, uh, on, the, on the, the east side, he wants to go up on the east side of the Dead Sea and lead them across into the promised land. And he's on his way up and he comes to Edom. And he asks for permission and he says, look, 
We're going to stay on the main road. We're not going to bother anything. Anything we use, any resources we use, we will pay you for it. All we want is passage through your land up around toward Moab so they can get close to getting across the Jordan River. The king of Edom said, no way. You are not passing through. And he put his army at the border and prevented them from passing through. So you can imagine how far around they had to go to get where they were going. Several other things happened. And we're, you, know, you can pursue this and see how, how the hostility between Edom and Judah just developed through the years. But when you come down to the, to the day of Obadiah, what it really comes down to is this. Edom refused to help Judah as the Babylonians were ransacking. Jerusalem and Judah even taking advantage of Judah in their time of need look at verse 10 again because of the violence against your brother Jacob Judah you'll be covered with shame you will be destroyed forever Edom on the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem you were like one of them you should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune. God is holding Edom accountable. Seven times in verses 12, 13, and 14, just three verses, seven times he talks about in the day of their destruction, in the day of their misfortune. Two times he says in the day of their trouble. Three times he says in the day of their disaster. It's repetitive intentionally to point out how poorly, how badly Edom responded to what, to what the Babylonians were doing to Judah. And his charges, each time he talks about the day of their destruction, the charges he brings through Obadiah, you stood aloof, you rejoiced, you looked down on your brother, you boasted, you marched through their gates, you seized their wealth. And maybe worse, the worst thing of all, you cut down their fugitives. Survivors who were trying to escape. And you met them on the road and butchered them. Because of this, God's judgment is being pronounced by Obadiah on the nation of Edom. The underlying root to Edom's problem is pride. And God makes that very clear through Obadiah. Verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home in the heights. You who say to yourself, well, who can bring me down to the ground? Much of Edom was situated in terrain that was steep and mountainous. I mean, just look at that. Can you imagine trying to attack a people who lived in that kind of territory? I mean, they, they saw themselves as pretty much invincible. I mean, there were steep ravines that if an army would come in, they would have to go through those ravines and, and the army of Edom could be right there looking down and, and, and just ready to take on anybody. And they're looking at what happened and they're saying, you know what? The Babylonians destroyed Judah and Jerusalem. Hey, we're still standing. We're still here. And they thought they were untouchable. They thought they could defend themselves against any attack from those steep clifftop fortresses. At least this generation thought that. Again, verse 3. You say to yourself, who can bring me down? And the Lord answered immediately. Though you soar like the eagle and you make your nest among the stars, from there... I, God says, will bring you down. And that's exactly what happened in 553 B.C. They found out they weren't invincible. They found out the word of God and the judgment of God was real. Of course, I think about that, and, and, and you probably do too. How many nations, how many empires, how many kings and dictators come to mind who believed they were invincible and that no one could take them down? And yet in all of human history on the face of this earth, there hasn't been a king 
or a nation or an empire that was invincible. Not one. I'm reminded of Psalm 46, 6. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. Pretty strong words, aren't they? I'm reminded of Proverbs 16, verse 8. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Now, it's one thing to think about the pride of nations and the pride of, of, of dictators and, and leaders of nations. Matter of fact, it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating, and we read and study about, about them. But it's a little less comfortable and a lot more challenging when you and I are willing to, to bring it right down to individual pride, to bring it right down to personal pride. It gets a little more uncomfortable when you and I start looking at our own lives and see where we struggle with pride. C.S. Lewis spoke of pride as, as the utmost evil. The utmost evil. Isn't that interesting? It's in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, chastity, anger, greed, and drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice, he says. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride. Because pride sets us up with God. So we're going to think for the last part of our time about pride. At the personal level. Pride is as it speaks to our lives and as we struggle with it. And I want to mention three different manifestations of pride that I see that, that are pretty prevalent. And <clears throat> this doesn't mean that list is exhaustive. It might just get you thinking about other types of pride that we deal with. The first type of pride I want to mention is self-sufficient pride. This is the pride of Edom. This is the pride of independence. This is the pride that old Frank Sinatra sang about. I did it my way. I'm living life on my terms. Nobody else's. I'm making the decisions for my life. I'm choosing the paths that I walk down. Nobody is going to tell me how to live my life. And I would suggest to you that in the culture and, and world in which we live, this is the number one model that is held up for how to live your life. This is the number one way of how to, to live your life. You know, you're the captain of your own destiny. So you take the wheel of that ship and you show who's in charge. And you see, there's just enough truth in those last couple of statements, there's just enough truth that it can be misleading and deceiving. Isn't that the way the enemy works? The enemy's not often bold in our face. The enemy, more often than not, is going to mislead us. He's going to deceive us. And unless we are connected in our walk with God, we might be deceived. We might be misled. You are the captain of your own destiny. In the sense that only you can make the decisions about the direction of your life. So that is true to a point. But where are you looking for guidance and direction to make those decisions as you move forward in your life? Because self-sufficient pride, the pride that is insisting, I'm going to do it my way, refuses the guidance and direction of God. Refuses to enter into a relationship with the living God. Keeps him at arm's length. Refuses to look to the scriptures for wisdom and guidance in how to make decisions and walk through life in, a, in, a, in the best possible way. Refuses to acknowledge that we are designed to know him and walk with him. And that the best possible way 
to, to make decisions in life and choose the path of life is to do it walking hand in hand with God, his wisdom and direction and his word as what is there as our guidance. Self-sufficient pride rejects the teachings of the church. In other words, self-sufficient pride wants nothing to do with God and his ways. Now, maybe most of us, that's not where we are, at least with the major thrust of our life. We might see pockets in our lives where that's true. Certain areas of our lives where nobody's going to tell me what to do. Just know right now that is standing in opposition to God. But there's a second kind of pride I want to mention, and that's spiritual pride. And if you seek to be a follower of Jesus, you probably wrestle with this kind of pride. I, I, I do. And I, and I think it's something that, that all of us probably struggle with that seek to be faithful to Jesus. And there's a lot of different versions of spiritual pride. <clears throat> there's a spiritual pride that says, I have arrived. Look at me. By I have arrived, I have arrived spiritually. There's a, there's a, that's, that's a pride that places us almost automatically above other people. I don't think that's where God wants us, is it? Placing ourselves above others, better than others. There's a spiritual pride that proclaims, hey, I'm more spiritual than you are, right? Closely akin to that is a spiritual pride that says, look to me, I have the answers. I'm the guru. There's a pride that looks down on others in judgment and condemnation. It's funny how we can be lost and then found by Jesus and brought into right relationship with with him and all of a sudden we're looking at the people around us that we're right where we used to be and we're looking down on them. That's spiritual pride. There's a spiritual pride that exudes my way of approaching God is superior to your way. And if you're not doing it like I'm doing it, you're not doing it right. Have you heard yourself yet? Have you seen yourself in any of those? The problem with spiritual pride is most of us, when we're dealing with spiritual pride, are blinded to the reality that it's in our lives. We don't see it. We think everything's okay. But those that are around us see it in us. Because, and you know how they know? Because when they're around us, we can make them feel inferior in some way. There's not a follower of Jesus walking close with him that would ever want to make anybody on the face of this earth feel inferior. There's only one person in all of creation that we are to feel inferior to. And that's Jesus, right? And it doesn't take long when we stand next to the Lord and begin to compare notes on lives and thinking we see our deep need for him. You know, the opposite of pride is humility. We're going to kind of wrap it up with humility, but before I do it, I want to mention one more kind of pride, the pride of false humility. False humility. This is a demon I understand. See, I got to be humble before you guys, right? (laughs) That's a problem. And anybody that's a pastor understands what I'm saying. Maybe you understand that as a deacon. Maybe you understand that as a Sunday school teacher. What is false humility? Simply put, it's this. The ability to come across to others as humble. And be pretty convincing about it. But when you step back and you're by yourself and you look deep down inside and you see the darkness that's there and you see the pride that's there 
and you see it in yourself. It's kind of like spiritual mountains of pride underneath the surface that we're fully aware of, but we can come across as humble. It's kind of like, in my mind's eye, I think about the mountains under the ocean. I mean, there are mountain chains in every ocean that go all around the world. Huge mountains, but you can't see them. Right off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, about a mile and a half off, there's some mountains underneath the ocean, and one of them is just under 8,000 feet tall. So think about that. There, that's a mountain off, the, off of Cape Cod that is higher than any mountain in West Virginia. There's a lot that bubbles up inside of us. There's a lot that's going on inside of us, which is why Jesus always said what's happening inside of us is, and we, is more important than, than, than what we put in or, or, or how we present ourselves on the outside. Because what's inside of us becomes who we are on the outside. False humility wrestles with every kind of spiritual pride we've already talked about. False humility impacts our relationship with God. And it impacts negatively our ministry to others. Pride. There's a lot more we could say about pride. But I kind of want us to wrap things up by thinking about what true biblical humility is. What does that look like? And when I think about that, there's only one place I can go because it's the ultimate answer. And that's Philippians chapter 2. And if you have your Bibles, you might turn there. Philippians 2, I want to look at verse 3 and kind of move from there. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves he's talking about a mindset and how to approach life every day consider others better than yourselves each of you should look not only to your own interests but to the interests of others and so Paul as he's writing to the Philippians is trying to explain what that looks like a little bit more about considering others better than yourselves in humility looking to the interests of others And then he says in verse 5, but your attitude, is like he's kind of like, let me just put it this way. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who is the portrait of humility. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Wasn't it absolutely beautiful driving here today? Did you notice how beautiful blue the sky was? I mean, stop and think about, we think about the beauty of this creation. Whether it's the ocean waves or the mountains or the rushing streams or whatever it might be. The flowers that we plant. To think that this unique planet was put in the solar system it was put in, in the place in the universe it was put in, by our creator, our creator who happened to empty himself and become like us. The creator of the universe became like us. Yes, we are the crown of his creation. But he became like us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You and I can ponder this every day until the day he brings us into his presence and we will continue to find new facets of it. 
the creator of the world allowed himself to die at the hands of his creation. At the hands of the very people that he came to earth to save. That is the picture of humility. That is exactly what we remember every time we take the bread and the cup. Every time I think about that, I say to myself, Joe, who in the world are you to get on your high horse and look down on anybody? Who in the world are you to think that you are better than anybody else on the face of this earth? Who in the world are you to think you are all that? And like you said in your children's story, considering the fact that anything you and I are, any gifts that we are or have, any talents that we use, who are they from? They're from God. And the very one who made us emptied himself and died for us. That we might not spend eternity separated from him. I'm glad he wasn't like the biblical character Pilate who washed his hands and walked away because he couldn't figure out a situation. He didn't give up. He could have. Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The ultimate portrait of humility, Jesus, as he emptied himself and gave his life, was lifted up by the Father above all others. Isn't that somewhat of a picture of what happens when you and I empty ourselves. When you and I humble ourselves before God. And fall before him. Acknowledging our deep need for a savior. Acknowledging that we are nothing without him. Acknowledging that life is found in him. And that once we acknowledge that and embrace the gift of salvation. He lifts us up. And we begin to pursue the life he envisions for us. The very best possible existence we can find on the face of this earth. And that's all because of the love and humility of Christ. All possible. If he hadn't done it, you and I would be lost forever. I trust <clears throat> that as you and I look at our lives, and I, and I strongly encourage you to do that, and as we talk to God about it, as we pray about it, God, show us spiritual pride. Show us self-sufficient pride. Show us false humility. Show us where we need to get on our knees before you. I pray that we will have the courage to do that. Because when we do, that's when God can take us and use us and shape us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our time. We thank you for your word that is so very true. This prophecy of Obadiah toward Edom. And what we can learn from it. But God I pray above all else. You show us the pride that we have within our lives. That is not from you. That lifts us up. God may we only be lifted up by you. Help us to. To make the decisions we need to make. To put ourselves in right relationship with you. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. 
who paved the way for us. Amen. The worship team is, is going to come and lead us in a, uh, a beautiful hymn. Is it the worship team? Oh, okay. Dave's going to come and lead us. When I survey the wondrous cross, it's just a beautiful, beautiful hymn. And uh, I'm going to, we're very spaced out right now. And if you have a decision to make, you're not going to be stepping over anybody. If you have a decision to make, as we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, uh, there's probably room for two spots right up here on this row. That row over there, the front row's open. If there's anything that you, and after we're finished, I will, I will sit with you. Or I'll even come up and, and, and talk with you for a minute while we're singing. But whatever's on your heart, whatever decision, if there's a prayer need, uh, please, please respond. Let's stand together when I survey the wondrous cross. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time. It is a joy to, to worship together, to be here in this sanctuary. And if we can't be in the sanctuary, to, to worship together. Uh, Lord, even though we're apart, there's one body. We thank you for our church family. Lord, I want to lift up the, the names that were just mentioned. Kim Patrick family of Rose Blaylock, Evelyn Richardson. In each of those situations, we pray for your hand to be upon them, your will to be done. May all eyes be fixed upon you. And Lord, as we leave this place, may we leave here in the humility of your son, Jesus, with our eyes fixed upon him. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.